Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. I hope you had a marvelous Thanksgiving and you didn't eat anything I wouldn't eat. So uh, a couple of announcements. Um, first of all, reminding everybody we have this new amazing course on vaccines that um, I think all consumers and all health practitioners should take. Um, one of the reasons we wanted to do this is there is a lot of information scattered all over the place about this issue. Uh, it's disorganized, it's hard for somebody to do the research on their own and come up with all the stuff that we have. But I think the other thing is that there's so much rhetoric and emotion associated with this vaccine issue. And while I totally understand that on both sides, um, we have to take the emotion and the rhetoric out of it and just deal with the facts. And I think that's one of the strengths of Wellness Forum Health, and we're going to bring that strength and, and um, uh, that, that specialization to this vaccine course. And so strongly urge you to take it. Even if you don't have uh, children who are um, who you have to worry about this issue with, it, it affects travel, it affects employment situations, and all kinds of other, uh, other things. So I, I think everybody should take this course. And I have to say, just reading through the slides in preparation for Dr. Weller filming her lectures, I've learned a lot. Second thing is holiday gifts. Um, I don't know about you, but the people who I know do not need more tchotchkes for the coffee table and sweaters and things like that. Uh, so I send them healthy foods from our kitchen. We make the best gingerbread biscotti. Well, I don't know if you call it healthy, but it's better than better health, more healthy than many other foods that you could have sent to people. And um, uh, gift certificates for yoga and foods from our store. Uh, one of my friends I'm buying a membership for, she really, really wants to join Wellness Farm Health. So uh, if you're interested in holiday gifts, send me an email. I'll send you the list of things. Um, and then winter semester is a little ways off, but it'll be here before you know it. We're offering some phenomenal courses, including the Diet and Lifestyle Intervention course, which is qualifies for CMEs, CEs for nurses, doctors, dietitians, etc. So um, lots going on here. Uh, it is December, but we're still busy at work here. All right, so uh, a couple things to talk about today. Um, and I want to start with uh, diagnosing high blood pressure. Uh, one of the most important points Dr. Gilbert Welch makes in his most recent book, Less Medicine, More Health, is that the smaller the abnormality that is shown in a diagnostic test, the less likely a person is to be helped by treatment and the more likely the person is to be harmed. This is especially true when treating people for high blood pressure and especially true in today's environment because medical societies, drug companies have lowered the diagnostic parameters for diagnosing high blood pressure and they have lowered the target for treatment. So this has resulted in millions more Americans being diagnosed with high blood pressure and much more aggressive treatment. Now the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force does recommend screening asymptomatic people for high blood pressure starting at age 18. And, and I don't necessarily disagree with that, but, but they do um, add some cautions that I think are being largely ignored. In addition to measuring blood pressure in a medical setting, the task force recommends also taking measurements outside of medical settings to confirm high blood pressure before starting treatment. This is easy to do, by the way. Blood pressure can be measured by small portable devices that are inexpensive at regular intervals while people participate in their regular daily activities. The advice is consistent with recommendations from other groups. Um, Dr. Peter Lin, for example, states that blood pressure measurement taken, taken in a doctor's office, they, they just represent a moment in time. They're certainly not representative of the individual's blood pressure in general. Furthermore, patients who are nervous in the doctor's office will often show high blood pressure when actually they're fine outside of the doctor's office. And then there's the issue of mass hypertension where a person can appear normal in the doctor's office and their blood pressure is actually high elsewhere. So Dr. Lin supports the task force's recommendation to monitor blood pressure at home in order to determine which patients qualify for treatment and how best to treat them. And this issue came up at the European Society for Hypertension's conference a couple years ago. They were saying, um, we just don't, we cannot start medicating people until we have better and more accurate information about what their blood pressure really is. Now, if this were to happen, and it's going to be difficult to make it happen, the patients are going to have to start taking charge of the situation. The reason is it's good for patients, but terrible for business. Many patients do have white coat syndrome, which causes their blood pressure to spike. 
when they're in the doctor's office and this results in them being treated for high blood pressure when they probably don't have it. Um, and if they were monitoring their blood pressure at home, they wouldn't be medicated in the first place. But there's another whole group of patients that I have some concern about, and that is the group who improve their diet, exercise, lose weight, do all the things that they need to do in order to get off of blood pressure medication, and then go to the doctor's office and their blood pressure is still high. And some of those people who are members of Wellness Farm Health have shared with me that one of the reasons they think their blood pressure was high was because they were nervous and fear over the idea that they might not be given and permission, and I use air quotes there, to reduce or eliminate the drugs. Now, first of all, um, I, I don't like that idea of this paternalistic, maternalistic view of health care where people need permission. It should be more of a collaborative arrangement, in my opinion. But um, many of our members, and I'm not fond of this issue, uh, this idea, they just take matters into their own hands, take their blood pressure at home, and start reducing their meds on their own. This is actually something that should be done under the supervision of a doctor, uh, and doctors should be cooperative in this area. So I think that patients should get um, more concern and, and care than they're getting from their doctors. But in the meantime, all blood pressure patients uh, should, or all, all people should monitor their blood pressure at home before agreeing to treatment for, for hypertension. Um, they should be mindful of the fact that the thresholds are lower here in the United States than they are elsewhere. So don't be so quick to jump off the cliff and take medication. And if you are one of those folks who's working at reducing or eliminating blood pressure medication, taking your own blood pressure at home, recording, uh, your blood pressure at regular intervals so that you can show it to your doctor and say, look, I'm just not a candidate to be on two blood pressure medications. Let's get rid of one and then let's start working on reducing the other. Patients have to drive this process. Okay, so here's another um, uh, study I want to talk about today because it deals with something that um, I've been saying for a lot of years but lends some science to it and that is this issue of moderation. Um, moderation is a term that's subjective. Nobody knows what it means. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, it's been promoted as the way to eat by food companies and professional organizations who take money from food companies because if there's room for everything in a healthy diet, then we don't have to say don't eat this or this is a treat or eat less of that. Um, everything goes. And so anyway, um, there are dietary recommendations for moderation. I mean, the USDA uses this term. And the other thing is, um, is, is variety in the diet. Now, I want to talk about moderation first and, and just from an observation standpoint. During the 18 years I've been in this business, I've certainly looked at a lot of food journals. And one of the things that I've seen is people eating french fries, pastries, cheese, I mean, name, name a bad food. And, but they eat all of those things in moderation. And so what it adds up to is as much as three quarters of the calories on a weekly basis are coming from foods that are consumed in moderation, all bad. But it, it, the net result is 75% of the diet is bad. Um, and as for this variety thing, I think variety makes the diet interesting. I like a variety of foods. I like trying new ways of making foods. But having said that, many populations live on a really limited diet and they enjoy excellent health. So take the Okinawans, for example. 69% um, of their calories come from uh, sweet potatoes. and the Papua New Guineans, it's close to 90%. So variety is uh, fun. Um, it's interesting, but it is not necessary for optimal health. Now, in spite of this long-standing advice, variety and moderation, not much research has actually been done into how this translates into real life. So um, a research group looked at the effects of both variety and moderation. So to assess the relationship, researchers looked at the diets of 6,814 whites, Hispanics, blacks, and Chinese adults, and they looked at the relationship between variety and moderation and um, abdominal obesity and type 2 diabetes. The assessment included the number of different foods consumed in a week, the distribution of calories among foods consumed, and food attributes such as fiber, sodium, and trans fat. Waist circumference was evaluated at five years and type 2 diabetes incidence was evaluated at 10 years. The scoring system used to evaluate diets awarded more points for eating fruit, vegetables, nuts, soy, and cereals, and lower intakes of trans fat, dietary supplements, and moderate alcohol intake. Now here's what's very interesting. The analysis showed that the number of foods and moderation in intake was not associated with better health outcomes and that people eating the most diverse diets 
experienced more central weight gain with a 120% increase in waist circumference as compared to subjects with the least amount of variety in their diets. Those who had the most diversity had the worst diets. They ate less fruit and vegetables and whole grains and ate a lot more junk foods. Senior author Dr. Darius Mozafarian wrote, quote, these results suggest that in modern diets, eating everything in moderation is actually worse than eating a smaller number of healthy foods. So apparently these Okinawans may be onto something. Now I mentioned before, one of the problems with moderation is people don't know what it means. The definition is subjective. Our experience shows that dietary changes work much better when people are given prescriptive information uh, about what to eat. So less, more, and moderation mean different things to different people. While eliminate dairy, treats are for holidays, is quite clear. Furthermore, simplicity can be really helpful in people um, in helping people to convert to optimal diets, uh, particularly in the beginning. Um, I've been having a lot of conversations with people lately who seem to think that you have to cook like Chef Dell every day in order to enjoy optimal health and don't really understand that you only need three or four things to make that you like really well and that you can expand your horizons really gradually and it doesn't have to be all gourmet food. My diet on regular days is actually pretty simple. I eat a lot of salads with pre-washed greens and sliced mushrooms and cherry tomatoes and things that are easy to put together, microwave vegetables, microwave rice. I mean, it's not that I don't appreciate fabulous food, but in the context of some of the 18-hour days where I have an, an hour to, you know, to get home, get ready to teach for four hours and eat dinner and all that, there just isn't room for it. So simplicity can be very helpful. So um, this is just one study and one of the limitations is that it used food frequency questionnaires and that sort of thing, but it sure is consistent with what we've seen here for 18 years and, um, uh, and I think we can just kind of get rid of moderation as being the key to uh, good eating and good health. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.